The music will be helpful. Yeah. A very good afternoon to uh, all of you. A warm welcome to this session on the future of uh, intelligent services. I think uh, some of you were probably present at the last session, which was the future of militaries. And I will say once again, just as I said then, that this is a historic first because while the World Economic Forum has been discussing uh, almost all conceivable co uh, topics, uh, we have never ever had a panel on the future of intelligence uh, services as such. And there's no coincidence that this is happening uh, right now at the beginning of uh, 2015. We've been through a remarkable and rather dramatic year uh, in many aspects, uh, uh, 2014, which in a sense both so the further rise of uh, asymmetric challenges, most typically illustrated by the rise of the Islamic State, which is not only operating in the Middle East, but also has many links to terrorism going on in other parts of the world, including close to here. And at the same time, uh, something we did not conceive, about, conceive of a year ago, the, uh, a full-scale conflict in Europe, in Ukraine, which is basically a, a, a total collapse of trust between uh, Russia the European Union and the US. So we're living in a dramatic world. And the intelligence services uh, have uh, uh, a complicated role in trying to help understand what's going on in this uh, complicated world, which is in many ways getting more difficult. For a few years, the discussion about the uh, intelligence service and surveillance was uh, marked by the Snowden revelations and by a strong emphasis on, uh, on containing the work of uh, intelligence services. I think today, uh, maybe there is a slightly new tone to the debate, given that, after all, uh, the public good that is provided by intelligence and uh, surveillance agencies also has prevented, for instance, terrorist attacks. So it's a big question with many dimensions. We are extremely fortunate to have a brilliant pal panel uh, helping us to understand this. We have General Kjell Granhagen, who is uh, Lieutenant General uh, Granhagen, who is uh, head of the Norwegian Intelligence uh, Service. We have... Uh, John Sawyer, who until a few uh, months ago uh, ran the MI6, the uh, British uh, Foreign Intelligence uh, Service. And we have Jean-Marie Guénaud, who has had a distinguished career in the UN, now head of uh, uh, the International Crisis Group, but who was also involved in a major overhaul of uh, French uh, security, uh, defense and intelligence thinking a few years ago. So that's the cost. And I would actually like to challenge uh, uh, General Granhagen first, uh, say a little bit about how your work looks given the complicated uh, developments in the world and what are your main concerns and challenges when it comes to the service that you are leading and the services that you're cooperating with. Yes, I think in, in, in order to, to discuss the future of intelligence and intelligence agencies, it would be of interest to look back a few years. I've been in the job for five years and I've seen the, uh, the tasks of intelligence uh, changing a lot during these um, uh, five years. Uh, I'll make four points. Uh, first of all, uh, the change of the, uh, the sort of terrorist threat that we are facing. Uh, five years ago, terrorism was something that foreign intelligence agencies worked as something happening out there in the world that could be projected into our societies. Uh, today, obviously, as we've seen illustrated in recent weeks, that has changed completely. Terrorism is now something that is among us on a daily basis. Uh, homegrown people, uh, some of them going for jihad abroad, then returning. Uh, some only influenced by uh, terrorist organizations out there urging uh, uh, action uh, in their home uh, countries. So obviously that challenges intelligence agencies in order to operate quite differently, uh, cooperating much more between external services and internal services in order to deal with that. Uh, the second area that has developed uh, significantly is cyberspace. Uh, five years ago, uh, that was not on top of the agenda. Now it definitely is, uh, with two aspects, really. Uh, one is in foreign intelligence agencies are crucial in determining the threats that face us in cyberspace. Uh, because we have the global uh, outlook and foreign intelligence agencies are those who are able to attribute uh, threats that we observe to certain actors uh, out there. Uh, the third um, important change relates uh, to uh, what you pointed out, Espen, uh, the uh, reappearance of interstate conflict 
very close uh, to uh, Europe. Uh, and for my agency, um, we have always followed um, that uh, uh, potential uh, risk or threat coming out of that. But I think for many uh, intelligence agencies, both in Europe and elsewhere, uh, that reappearance of interstate conflict is something that has forced us to change focus to a large extent. And finally, of course, the fourth point, um, the Snowden uh, leaks, which put a great focus on intelligence agencies, portrayed in media uh, in the way that uh, intelligence agencies pose a significant threat to individuals around the globe, to privacy, and to uh, the rights of individuals. Something that in my view has been largely overstated. Uh, in my view, uh, very few, uh, if any, uh, intelligence agencies around the globe are really interested individuals except those who actually pose a major threat to societies. Uh, uh, so uh, even if uh, some intelligence agencies collect, collect enormous amount of uh, information. Uh, there is a significant uh, difference, in my view, between uh, a mass collection of information and what is called mass surveillance. I think it's very important, and I think you, you indicated that in your opening statement, that uh, seeing the threats that now are clear and present in our part of the world, um, there is more of an understanding that intelligence agencies have a very important uh, job to do to balance the activities that intelligence uh, agencies will have to do with privacy and individual rights. That is something that our politicians must look into and find that right balance. There will never be anything like 100% security. There will never be 100% privacy. Striking that balance is the challenge of our politicians. John Sawyers, as a very recent head of uh, MI6, one of the world's most known, I think, foreign intelligence services, particularly thanks to uh, a relatively famous film. Um, <laughs> how, how do you, what have been your thoughts about striking that right balance as the world moves along? Well, the balance, which balance are you talking about? Between security and... Well, I'm not sure there's a trade-off between mm. uh, security and privacy. It's not as if the more security you get, the less privacy you have, or the more privacy you have, the less security you have. These... In a, in a free society like we, we enjoy in the West, um, your freedoms are guaranteed by security. <clears throat> and if security goes down, if you're subject, your society is subject to a series of uh, attacks, whether they're um, uh, terrorist attacks or cyber attacks, then people's privacy goes down as well. And meanwhile, if the security goes up, their privacy goes up as well. Mm. And so <clears throat> the, the job of uh, Western governments is to find the optimum <coughs> levels of privacy and security, so both are maximized. Do people uh, in your country understand uh, what you do or what the services are doing as a public good? Well, I, th I think they do. We had a, a recent survey uh, done by the Edelman Trust Barometer of uh, trust in various groups of business and government and NGOs um, and the media, <clears throat> and they're all in the going in the wrong direction. And they're all below 50%. I think NGOs were just above 50%, but descending quite rapidly. <clears throat> Actually, the police and the security intelligence services were up around 70%, which uh, Richard Edelman described as uh, uh, numbers to die for. Uh, and I think that does reflect the fact that, uh, first of all, we are contributing to a very real public good in the, terms, in the sense of not just of national security, but combating crime. Um, uh, uh, contributing through our uh, SIGINT agency to child protection and, and, and uh, combating uh, um, uh, paedophilia and so on, um, and um, uh, uh, defending uh, national institutions and, our, and the companies based in the UK from cyber attacks from overseas. Everybody recognises these are real threats. Mm. I think actually one of the big changes of the last um, uh, five years, or well, the last ten years probably, is that... Uh, the intelligence services are now the front line in national defence against the modern threats that our societies face. Um, and that's put us more in the, in the spotlight. Uh, it means we've got to uh, uh, accept a, greater, uh, a degree of greater openness and, and accountability. And I think that, in turn, will reinforce the levels of public support that we enjoy. 
Thank you very much. I'll, let's come back to the issue of trust because I think it's a key issue in this. But first to Jean-Marie Guénaud. Um, building on what John Sawyer just said, then based on your work on uh, national defense, security and intelligence in, in France, which I think in many cases are typical issues for any mo large modern country, um, how do you place the new challenges to the intelligence services in that broader context? Well, I think one of the challenges is that the, the distinction between the domestic issues and the international issues is eroding. Uh, you have uh, nationals who are connected to international network, like the terrorists who did the attacks in, uh, in Paris. And of course, the laws that apply to nationals are not the legal framework that applies to international operations. And so that raises both legal and operational uh, challenges. The legal challenge is what, what legal framework will be able to uh, protect the liberties, the freedom uh, of the citizens. And the operational challenge is a question of cooperation, uh, mm -hmm. so that because uh, the threat is mobile, and so you can't deal with your territory and ignore the territory of the neighbor. And that cooperation requires trust. So you need trust between the intelligence organization and the population it protects. You need also trust between the various uh, intelligence uh, organizations. And so this is quite a, quite a new world for... Let me build on that a very interesting point, because just also for everyone in the audience and everybody else on the planet are probably citizens of one or maybe two states, and which means they're foreigner in 192 uh, or more other states. And uh, since uh, the rules protecting nationals is different from foreigners, and since intelligence services deal with foreigners, which means your, for your national is my national is your foreigner, and your foreigner is my national, um, what, do, what kind of challenges does this international cooperation lead to in that, in that aspect? Well, John. I think as a Norwegian, Europe needs to have too much to worry about from, uh, uh, from our, our services. Um, and also, actually, uh, in our system in the UK, and I think in the European <laughs> Union, is uh, that you don't discriminate on the grounds of nationality. Now, not every country has that arrangement. The United States is different and has different protections for US nationals than for non-nationals. But for uh, uh, our um, uh, intelligence collection is focused on those who threaten our society um, and uh, those who can provide intelligence central to national security is not based on nationality. Now, uh, the points on cooperation are really important. Um, and uh, uh, Jean-Marie Gaynor has, has mentioned cooperation between um, services within one state and, and uh, uh, certainly the old stovepipe systems where your human agency, your SIGINT agency and your domestic security service operated in different, um, different uh, stovepipes, that, that is a thing of the past now. The, these services have to operate very closely together. Uh, Jean-Marie mentioned the uh, uh, horrific attacks in, in Paris two weeks ago um, and they had connections from, in France, overseas, and the way of, uh, of, of, of monitoring those activities it requires all forms of intelligence and uh, obviously within a, in a clear legal framework. And also requires intensive cooperation between services in different countries. Now obviously between European services or with our American partners that's relatively straightforward. It is more complicated in uh, other societies which don't have the same values or the same degree of respect for human rights that, that we have. Um, but nonetheless, a degree of cooperation is needed and needs to be carefully regulated. But mm -hmm. your point about, um, uh, 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 I know the Snowden revelations have raised concerns about um, uh, uh, collection, uh, sort of friend-on-friend -friend style collection, but that, that's a very small proportion of, of any um, modern intelligence agency's work. It's all about the, the massive threats we've got, not just the <coughs> of uh, terrorism and cyber, but also the threats posed by, by uh, chaos or, or uh, states acting uh, erratically or illegally in, uh, in, in different parts of the world. We could of course turn that question on its head by saying that it probably is quite a need to be able to follow what your own nationals are doing in faraway places, the government of which may be collaborative but not up to the standards. So that is a challenge the other way around as well. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the, uh, uh, I think we see it in the same way in Norway. Uh, our focus is on those who can pose a uh, threat to our society, whether those being 
uh, foreigners or they are being Norwegian uh, nationals. The new dimension of it uh, over the, 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 the last few years, as I mentioned, is the fact that our own nationals are doing things that they didn't do in the past mm -hmm. and which requires also us to follow that activity when it uh, takes place outside of our borders. Inside our borders, obviously, it's the, the internal security services that do that. Uh, the other thing that comes out of that is obviously the, the, the larger need for a thorough coordination between the internal service and what we're doing externally. Mm. Um, the, um, you, you, you mentioned, uh, General, the, the advent of cyber. I mean, after all, the, the Cold War ended 25 years ago and the World Wide Web was invented 25 years, 25 years ago. There was no connection between the two facts, but it means that the, the whole, the last quarter of a century has really changed the way we connect and communicate in ways which nobody really thought about before. Is it helpful to the services represented here that people live their lives uh, online? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the, the challenge there is that the haystack has become interesting. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's a great uh, difficulty and a, and a great help. Um, we used to focus, I think, I mean, all organizations used to focus on the needle. You, you, you want to uh, do surveillance on, that, on one particular individual because he, might be, he or she might be a threat. Now, you, all data are interesting because if you have good computers, you will detect the anomaly that will then point you to uh, a, potential, uh, a potential risk. And that's the problem uh, of mass uh, collection of data versus mass uh, surveillance uh, that was uh, mentioned by, by, the, by the general. Um, an, an intelligence organization today spend uh, a growing amount of its money on, the, on technology, on acquiring uh, very powerful computers to be able to, um, manip to use the mass of data that, it, that can be uh, collected. Many of those data are data that are not uh, at all uh, secret. Uh, there are data that may be collected from uh, telecommunication uh, companies, metadata, I mean, who calls whom, etc. But there are also data that are just uh, uh, available, uh, and actually the intelligence organizations are not the only ones collecting those uh, data. I mean, all the major companies involved in the internet, and Google is, um, being the most famous, uh, do, just, uh, do just that. Uh, the challenge uh, there is how do you make sure that that massive collection of data uh, respects the law, and having oversight in those areas which are very complicated from a technological standpoint is not the same as asking a judge uh, in a traditional uh, system, I want to uh, put surveillance uh, on Mr. X uh, and you pr produce a file and the judge looks at it and says, well, yeah, that's fine. If you submit to a commission an algorithm to say we would want to do that kind of uh, surveillance, that's a much trickier uh, activity to, to control. And I think this is the diffic that difficulty is what makes uh, the public nervous. And I think uh, I understand uh, that nervousness. Myself, I'm nervous because I think there can be a, it can be abused or it can be misunderstood. Uh, and so I think there, and to answer your question, we have a, uh, I think the security apparatus has an enormous help, but we need to, ra to ramp up the quality of the oversight to make sure that that extraordinary multiplier that uh, technology provides does not destroy the trust between uh, the organization that use the technology and the general public. Uh, general. Hmm. Yes, um, um, just to follow up on, on, on Jean-Marie there, um, during the, the time of the, the, the Snowden leaks, um, we often got the, the, the um, question, why do you have to do this mass collection of, uh, of uh, metadata, for example? Mm. Well, why don't you just concentrate on the terrorists? Um, that, of <laughs> course, applies very, very well to those terrorists that you actually know from before. Uh, but the, the problem now is the terrorists you don't know about and the threats you don't know about. Uh, and in order to find those threats, in my view, threats, in my view, it is very difficult to avoid uh, collecting uh, data more broadly. 
So how can we do that and, uh, and maintain the trust of these societies? And in my view, there are three very important things there. First of all, it is uh, intelligence activity, uh, including foreign intelligence, uh, intelligence activity, has to be regulated by national law. There has to be a legal framework for what we do that is very well understood and, uh, uh, in, in all parts of society. The uh, second one is we need authorization mechanisms for the various efforts and the various methods that we have to use to do this. This also has to have uh, uh, be, be legitimized in the uh, societies that we live in. And the third element is oversight mechanisms. Uh, in Norway, we have a very thorough oversight mechanism, which I appreciate very much. I find that very useful to what we're doing. It uh, helps my people doing their job correctly, and it uh, gives uh, legit legitimacy in the Norwegian so society, both at the political level, but also among the population. So if we are going to do these things that to some extent intrude into or is at least perceived intruding into uh, private lives, we need to build that trust with those types of mechanisms. Thank you, John. I agree with Jill on those uh, three points. I, <clears throat> obviously, our lives would be much easier if all these uh, terrorists and so on used a single system, you know, badguys.com, and then we could just go there <laughs> and, and, and cover that. Uh, but sadly, they don't. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it would be slightly bizarre if all the advances in technology and the use of bulk data analysis, which are improving our, our, uh, uh, the, the performance of business, improving the healthcare um, uh, uh, delivery and so on, somehow national security weren't allowed to use it. Mm. And that would be a very odd thing to, to say, that the most fundamental element of a government's responsibility can't use uh, modern advanced technology. So I very much agree that we need to be able to move forward in this area, but with the right, right level of regulation. The second thing I'd say, and, and you, you ask, uh, asked Espen um, about uh, whether moving onto a virtual life makes life easier. Well, up to a point, um, because the way in which the technology companies have reacted in the wake mm -hmm. of the Snowden uh, uh, leaks um, means that the level of cooperation between technology companies and, uh, and intelligence agencies has gone down, and that's... Uh, uh, that's, that's added to the threat in some ways uh, that we face because the intelligence collection is not as effective as it was before. And uh, the, the advances in technology mean that you could create complete no-go areas on the, on the internet, where it's just imp impossible for there to be any supervision or monitoring of what's happening on those, uh, on those systems. Now, we learned long ago, you can't have no-go areas for the police in our communities where they can't go in and they can't reinforce the, uh, enforce the, the rule of law because then you just give a, 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 an open door to the people who want to cause damage and want to uh, commit crimes and so on. It's the same on the internet. If you create a completely closed sector of the internet which is completely impenetrable and impossible to monitor, you're creating, you may feel a bit better that if you use it no one can access your bank account or no one can, can see what you're saying to, to your friends and family. But you're also creating a, 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 the perfect environment for evildoers of whatever types they may be to go about their trade. This latter point is extremely relevant here, since I'm sure in the audience there are many people from the IT or telecom or service provider industry. Uh, how would you ideally like to see the relationship uh, between the service you just led and them yeah. be? Well, I, I don't have a monopoly on uh, on wisdom on this, and, and the technology companies. Oh, but I asked you. <laughs> uh, the, te the technology companies have got uh, have got serious interests that need to be respected. They're, they're contributing hugely to uh, the advances in modern society. I think there needs to be a serious exchange, a serious um, uh, a dialogue between the technology companies and governments. Um, the uh, uh, attack we had in the UK um, about uh, two years ago, where a soldier was killed by. Um, uh, by uh, uh, a couple of young thugs inspired by Islam. Well, there are exchanges on Facebook that could have, um, that, that could have revealed um, uh, the air intentions, could have attracted surveillance towards those individuals and prevented that, that atrocity from being, being committed. Um, now, I, I think the technology companies do want to contribute to wider public goods, but they've been sort of um, uh, uh, seriously put off by some of the populist reactions <coughs> 
to the, uh, uh, the, the leaks that came out from Snowden. We need to find a new balance in here. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be a proper dialogue. It needs to include all the elements that Shell was, uh, was pointing to on the intelligence side. Uh, and uh, uh, on the technology company side, they need to be able to provide um, uh, uh, commitments on privacy. But that doesn't mean that they should be completely isolated from the, uh, uh, the agencies that are preserving our society, uh, security. Very interesting. When um, uh, John Podesta reported to President Obama recently, mm -hmm. I think it was about 18 months ago, on the use of bulk data uh, in government, uh, Podesta highlighted the intelligence agencies as having the most advanced and sophisticated systems of protecting privacy in areas of use of bulk data, far, far advanced from those that commercial companies operate. And uh, uh, that's, that, that's not bad for John Podesta to have said that in a report to President Obama in the wake of the, of the Snowden leaks. So uh, I just put that on the table as, a, as the sort of standards that we have. You know, we in the security community care about privacy. I do sometimes have a concern that those in the privacy uh, advocates, they just take security for granted and don't realize that it has to be worked for. Yeah. I don't totally agree there because <laughs> I, I do think that there's a big question on how you ensure security, whether you do it through a very centralized system of oversight where, of course, there is no go area, uh, there is no no go area. <laughs> or whether you, in a world where if you weaken uh, the systems pr to protect communication, the bad guys will, all, will also uh, use them, and whether the future for security is not in having strong encryption uh, that cannot, where there's no backdoor, there's no possibility uh, of breaking that. So yes, it is a no-go area, but it fragments the cyberspace uh, and protects every actor and that will also make life difficult for the, for, for the bad guys. It's a, it's a different model. But uh, I'm, I'm a little nervous that the notion that we need systems that we can access, they will be accessed also by the bad guys. That's very important when you think of cyber warfare, where um, you can, through cyber attacks, you can kill a lot of people if you disrupt a water distribution system, electrical, and all the vital in infrastructures. Um, is the best way to protect those systems to have uh, the capacity of the state uh, to um, go everywhere and, and so have the back doors or is it by making sure that there is a kind of uh, gradual strengthening of encryption that will make it very difficult for anybody to exploit the weaknesses of those systems? I know you have a view on this, but I'll open it up for the, for the audience for a second. Uh, first question is here. Uh, we have a microphone coming. And then it's uh, Antonio, please. Yeah. Mohamed Jaffa from Kuwait. My question is for you, Sir John. Mm -hmm. How effective has the intelligence community been at propagating the message to the public that um, they are there for the protection and for the promotion of security? For the longest time, people didn't know about the agencies. There was Snowden effect suddenly. And... Um, what you've written about in the Financial Times, what you're repeating now about encryption, mm. that um, we're allowing the hoods to walk the streets with a mask, mm. but we're not allowing the police and law enforcement mm. to go into these streets. I think that's a very powerful message, but has it been spread enough in the social media? We'll, we'll collect a few questions, okay. so the, uh, and Anton, the pleasure. Thank you very much, very interesting. And uh, I just think one issue that, that came out clearly in some of the lessons we need to learn from the post 9-11 period is perhaps lack of oversight and perhaps abuse by intelligence communities. And, and have we learned from these lessons and uh, for one? And the second question is, there is a difference between intelligence for the, for the sake of national security and then intelligence for the sake of, of criminal prosecutions, which is a vital part of our response, because ultimately these terrorists are committing terrible crimes and they need to be brought to justice. But is there a blurring of lines between intelligence for national security and intelligence for, for law enforcement? And is that a good or a bad thing? Thank you. Good one. Last question was here. First. Um, let me put you on the spot, John. Uh, I think we can all agree with what you said, that there needs to be a discussion about um, the supervision and oversight of intelligence agencies. But what specifically would you propose? Okay, well, 
Um, if I can have first you shot can. at the, yeah. so certainly the first and third questions. I think on the, on the first question, I think the era when a publicly funded institution could just operate completely behind closed doors, that's behind us. And uh, I think those agencies that continued to work in that way uh, were caught out by the uh, Snowden revelations, the Snowden leaks, because they didn't have a body of public understanding about the positives that they were working to. I've certainly tried during uh, my, year, my five years as chief of MI6 to open us up a little bit, to do it in public, through public speeches, through appearances, uh, um, open appearances in front of our, our parliamentary committee, and also to involve more people from the media and from parliament and, and business, uh, bring them inside um, our uh, famous headquarters on the Thames, and uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, explain a bit more about what we do. And I think you have to, in a modern society, you have to earn the trust. Uh, you have to keep on building the trust. You can't just assume that trust. So we do have to adapt to this uh, uh, very much so. In terms of the specific oversights and controls, <clears throat> in, the, in my time as chief, we saw a strengthening of the law, which um, uh, enhanced the role of the parliamentary committee so that they get right into operational detail. Um, and uh, you know it's, it's quite bracing when you're up before uh, Malcolm Rifkin and his committee uh, to uh, uh, respond on, on how certain operations were managed and whether they were effective enough. We've had a strengthening of the uh, two judges that uh, provide uh, ongoing oversight, one of intelligence operations and the other interception operations. Um, and uh, uh, they are expanding their role into areas uh, like bulk data as well. Um, and uh, it's like having an, an ongoing judge-led inquiry into the work of the intelligence agencies. Now, I don't say we've got it perfect. It's not perfect for all time. But the combination of clear ministerial authorizations for what we do, judicial oversight of the legality of what we do, parliamentary oversight of the appropriateness and accountability for what we do, I think these are pretty strong measures in place to ensure that what we're doing is indeed in the public interest. As I say, I think the high levels of trust that we get um, uh, from the UK, much higher than, than most of the other sectors of society, actually reflects that. Um, blurring of lines, is it happening? Is it a good or bad thing? And I would add, uh, is it possible to avoid? And why should we? Blurring of lines. Blurring between. of lines between the uh, you know national surveillance and foreign <coughs> intelligence. Well, it's, it's in intelligence and evidence collection. I think he was. Saying. Oh, that what you said. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the question was on intelligence and evidence collection. Yeah. yeah well, uh, in terms of, of, of gathering evidence uh, in in Norway, that is solely uh, the role of the internal uh, services and the police. Um, so we don't have any any role in that at all. Uh, our two major. Uh, tasks here is to give warning in the cases that we can give warning or threats uh, to the society, to, 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 to the country, uh, but also uh, in general to collect the information that will help our, our politicians make better decisions. Uh, realizing that uh, that information uh, does not only come from open sources, it also comes from information that is not generally uh, accessible. Um, I, in, in our country, uh, I don't see a blur of lines uh, here. I think it's clearly distinguished by law. Uh, there is specific law regulating the police and the police security service activities. Uh, and there is a specific law regulating uh, the work of the uh, foreign, foreign intelligence agency. And in general, none of the information that we collect uh, uh, abroad can be used in proceedings uh, nationally. On the, on, the, on the blurring of lines, uh, I think it's, it would be a very dangerous uh, thing because the whole idea of a judiciary process is that the accused has access <coughs> to I mean, uh, all the elements of the accusation and an intelligence organization cannot uh, divulge all, the, all its uh, sources. In a, and so it's really two, two different uh, logics. And on the oversight, uh, I, I think we're still badly lagging in democratic countries in terms of uh, having effective oversight for signal intelligence. Because interceptions is one thing, but uh, big data, um, management of uh, mass of information, that requires a whole new level of sophistication, technological sophistication to, to supervise that. Mm. And I, I the think- The supervisor needs to understand it. Yes, as well. to sort of, and that is not there. Let's take two, two more quick questions. One is here. Uh, 
technologies which are being manufactured, the new pro programs are, you know, being introduced by uh, United States or by British or Norway or the other countries who can really uh, be uh, brought into the, into the world for the security point of the view. I I'd like to know the panel. Thank you. What's the concept on that? Yeah. Th yes, right. We have the question here. And then. Countries in Europe are increasingly diverse. Um, are your agencies reflecting that diversity in order to be able to tap into all the resources of human intelligence that you can get or you need to get? Thank you. And then the How lady. How fast is that going? The lady back in the back here first. Fascinating panel, thank you so much. One thing that we haven't heard about is the role of human intelligence. How is mm. that is changing, particularly as part of the, the, the terrorist strategy is really homegrown. And I think the last one will be here. Actually, it was part of my question. Aren't we trying to rely too much on data and cyber intelligence? Mm -hmm and putting completely aside human intelligence on the ground. And aren't we at threat on organization that would intentionally not be on any form of social, whatever, uh, cyberspace places and be completely in the dark until the moment they're gonna hit? John, will you still need James Bond or can you? <laughs> The, the film about the computer won't be as fun. So, uh, yeah. no, well, um, uh, James Bond is a great uh, is a great uh, uh, set of movies, but <laughs> actually the reality is is not individuals out there operating on their own, but very very close teamwork. But um, I rather agree with this this sense that uh, um, uh, there has been a uh, a big focus recently, partly because of Snowden, on signals intelligence. But um, you can't task signals intelligence in the same way you can task a human agent. And so uh, human intelligence provides you with a quality and a feel for uh, what is happening inside another organization uh, uh, or a hostile, um, uh, uh, somebody who's hostile towards you, uh, that signals intelligence doesn't provide the same degree. So, but it's a combination of the two. And increasingly, <coughs> the two are, are, are working together. And uh, any policymaker will want to know um, what is the policy analysis? What is the signals intelligence saying? And what is the human intelligence saying before they come to a decision? Yeah, and, uh, sorry, and just to make the point, the diversity point, I'm not sure quite what diversity you're referring to, but um, any successful organization these days has to be diverse in every regard. It has to have a whole range of skills. You have to have professionalization within your organization on technology, <clears throat> on finance, and how you manage your talent. You need to draw from the full spectrum of society. Um, there was a, a time, sort of, uh, uh, certainly when I first joined the intelligence service back at the end of the 1970s, uh, women were a rarity, except as uh, in support roles. Now women play an absolutely central role on the front line. And likewise, people of different ethnic minorities and, uh, and backgrounds. Uh, it's only it's diverse teams uh, prov provide a much stronger um, uh, outcome mm -hmm. than the monochrome uh, uh, teams do. Humans in this context, of obviously not only operators out there, but also the people to interpret all the data. I guess the more the more information you have, the more it's necessary to have the human brain to actually understand what matters. Absolutely, and and I would draw the attention to the fact uh, my my agency is a multi-source intelligence agency. We do signals intelligence. Uh, we do other types of technical intelligence uh, like network intelligence, uh, imagery intelligence. Uh, open source intelligence is extremely important in this. So there is a there is a multitude of different ways that we collect information. And as you uh, uh, point out, uh, on top of this, it is the analytic process that puts all this together and is able uh, both to uh, uh, put together a picture of the facts, but also to make predictions on what will happen in the future. Those are the uh, very important roles of, of um, an intelligence agency. So there is more than just signals intelligence uh, and human intelligence. But I, I fully agree with, with John that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, human intelligence is still going to be extremely important. And there are things that you cannot replace by technical means uh, that needs to be done by humans in the future. Especially if you want to disrupt as yes. well as inform. Thank you. We're coming towards an end. I'll give you the floor. I just want to say that, um, you know, uh, the, the, co the product products that the services produce, of course, can be specific on the, of a defined target, but also a very important analysis of larger trends. 
some of that information might be very useful beyond the borders of the state that produce it, maybe also for the global public good. The World Economic Forum is here to improve the state of the world, as we say. And uh, is, there any, is there any way, for instance, you, to go back to your UN background, is there a way that to build on the collective intelligence that has been created by advanced intelligence services for more sort of long-term uh, <coughs> global good? I think there is, because we are focused, I think, in this debate largely on tactical intelligence, where you need to combine the human and the CIGIN to know whether there's going to be an attack in Paris or Oslo or any, any other capital, or London, any other capital. That's one thing. But then there is the understanding of the world, the prevention. Uh, and there, there is now a continuum between the kind of work that intelligence organizations can do with their computing power the kind of work that private companies like Google can do with their own uh, computing power, and the need of the general public, which does need to make the use of those, public, of those data to be able to anticipate, uh, to see that there is a situation deteriorating in that particular place, and that since prevention is such, so much better than uh, cure, uh, how you can address that. And there, I think, we need to see how intelligence organizations can work more cooperatively with the United Nations, not just to provide tactical intelligence to peacekeepers so that they don't get killed by a terrorist attack, but strategic intelligence so that the United Nations, the world, and globally, can be more in a preventive mode than in a reactive uh, mode. And that's, that's, in a way, the most fundamental issue. Very last question, is this an area where we can foresee some kind of public-private cooperation? Well, um, I, I wouldn't go as far as uh, Jean-Marie, actually. I think uh, if you want to have effective intelligence and security agencies, they're going to have to, um, you have to accept that they're going to have to operate largely in secret, accountably, but largely in secret. Um, and uh, although I'm very fond of the United Nations, and you and I worked together in New York, Jean-Marie, in previous roles, but the United Nations is not a place where you can put in uh, sensitive information and have reliability that it's going <laughs> to stay secret. Um, so you have to build a degree of, uh, a, degree of uh, uh, a large degree of trust here. And, uh, uh, you know, people's lives are at stake. Uh, we've talked about human intelligence uh, penetrations. The individuals who do this work are phenomenally brave and committed individuals. Um, who are very exposed. And if a piece of information which only they could have access to becomes mm. public, then they get exposed and they get subject not just to arrest, but quite, quite often the potential of, of torture and, and, and death. Uh, so we owe a huge responsibility to these people who are contributing to the defense of our societies. And we have to accept that one cost of this is that a lot of the information is going to have to remain secret. I mean, I don't, um, I, I, I think the futurologists have not been very successful in the last 15 years predicting what the next threats are going to be. I think we as intelligence agencies, we can try and contribute to the best understanding of trends and, and, and areas <coughs> of instability and threat and so on. But above all, we have to have the capability kept fresh and live and, and deployable quickly in order to react effectively to when new threats emerge. Thank you. Here at the World Economic Forum, we do not predict, but we do strategic foresight. It was uh, really good to have this panel. Uh, time was short. It was the first, but not the last. Thank you to all three of you for, uh, for speaking openly about this, and uh, thank for the audience. <laughs>